okay, don't pass out. Don't pass out. Don't pass out. I'm so excited. It's unreal. This is, this is the craziest thing we've ever gotten to do. I think in all of our social media endeavors in life and you guys, you, you need you. Okay. Should we just, should we tell them? This is how we know we've made it. I, yeah, I can't, I can't even. Okay. We're going to tell them. So I'm Shay. I'm Tyler. And this is Oi with the Pot already. So today, we're not giving you a recap, reference, deep dive, any of that. We're giving you something so much better. I, I can't do it. Can you do it? So this week, we are going to be interviewing Stan Zimmerman, who is one of the actual writers on Gilmore Girls. And, and one of the coolest humans we have ever had the pleasure to meet. Oh, yeah. We met him at FanFest, and we'll talk all about that. He talks about the show. Every, everything. He talks about his amazing life journey. I, I'm so enthralled by everything he's done. He talks about life, uh, political things. He talks talk, anything you can think of. He talks about it. So I think we should just let them hear the interview. Let's let's get started. Thank you, thank you, Stan, for coming in to talk with us on the podcast today. Uh, for the listeners that aren't aware, Stan was one of the writers on Gilmore Girls and. Uh, Fantastic person. We met you at FanFest and just I'm I'm a Stan fan. Oh, <laughs> a Zimmer fan, they're called. Yes. <laughs> so uh we have a lot to cover between all of the different projects that you've worked on from Roseanne, Golden Girls, Gilmore Girls, which is primarily our focus. Uh you also do have a book that is coming out in February. Uh I have the pre-order oh. and I am waiting for it. Uh, it's going to be one of the gifts for my wife for Valentine's Day. <laughs> oh, so thank you. That's so romantic of you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I learned a long time ago, whatever she wants, she will get. And that is no matter what the primary focus. So <laughs> she really wanted this book. I am actually very interested in reading it myself. So it's a win-win for for both of us. And it's not just about the shows I've worked on, but also the wonderful women, uh, not only on the shows, but in my life. And um, as people that have had uh, gotten um, early editions of it, uh, they seem to be really responding to uh, being knocked down in, in show business, but really in any career. And how do you keep going mm. and get your, pick yourself back up? So in... Uh, college they started having us keep a journal and i've been keeping journals ever since then so i journaled all during golden girls and roseanne and gilmore girls so when i was putting this book together i went back to the journals and i pulled all those that had to do with the women i worked with and i really wanted to contrast where i was as a young person in the middle of all that craziness to now I would say older, wiser, little question mark on that. Um, how our views change and how we feel and um, why did I keep going? How did I keep going? Um, and seeing things I did back then that I didn't consciously do, I just did. Um, like really appreciating getting those first early jobs. Um, you know, when you I moved out, tell a very young and was really the first of our group to have a real job and you know decent money coming in and first to buy a house and I just knew how lucky I was and how precious and what a career was and a career in show business has many ups and downs and how do you ride the down um, like Amy you think oh my god you know one of the most talented writers ever um, but she you know was unemployed and going to unemployment like the rest of us and finding a new way or how do you reinvent yourself which Jim and I have done many times when sitcoms are dead you know we got involved in um, TV movie musicals we got to write uh, rewrite the Annie movie uh, that mm -hmm. Kathy Bates and Kristen Chenoweth and Audrey McDonald and Alan Cumming and it was a crazy cast Victor Garber um, we got into movies. We got to write both Brady Bunch movies. 
Um, uh-huh. So there's different times. And then recently uh, I started getting back into theater and I've been doing that uh, the past 10, 12 years. And um, theater saved me as a teen uh, that was bullied and I didn't want to go to school the next day. And um, so it's great to return to theater and not only directing other people's plays, but writing my own. Having that healthy outlet is just important for whatever you find is your outlet at times, if you're having a rough go, especially when you're a young person. At at any age. And then, you know, at the beginning, we would be offered three to five series per season. We got to pick. And, you know, then you get older and people don't necessarily want to hear from you. And I'm like, but I'm the same writer. Why, why, is, why are people treating me differently? Um, so dealing with all of that and then the people in your life, finding the cheerleaders. Luckily, my mother was my big, big cheerleader. And um, so I talk a, a lot about her in that and how she helped form me and introduced me to independent movies. And, um, you know, growing up in a suburb of Detroit, I didn't know what an indie movie was. And we would, you know, go on a Sunday afternoon to see these weird little films. Um, and, you know, they kind of became my vocabulary and always in the back of my head. So uh, before we get started, if there's anything that you don't want to talk about that we ask you, we can move on or delete it. Uh, so if there's a question that you just don't like, just let us know. <laughs> Uh, I've dealt with Roseanne, so you two got to, you know, you got to up your well, game. Well, that, that will be one of the questions gonna, at some point. Yeah, if, you're, if you think you're going to throw me, <laughs> yes. I, I did notice work, the dust gotta... jacket of your book when I pre-ordered it, for the record. <laughs> did you notice it was on the back? I did. There was a, <laughs> uh, an abnormally large number of periods to get it onto the back intentionally, it seemed. <laughs> yeah, so that was a little... Um, uh, kerfuffle, if you might want to use a, a Gilmore Girls kind of phrase, um, with my publishers. I wanted it on the front. Mm. And for some reason, they thought Roseanne might not like that. And I, I wonder said, why. And, <laughs> you know, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> you know, is uh, the worst would probably be ending up on her podcast. But, well, um, yeah. I, 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 I mean, I don't know if you've, if you've seen uh, some of her, like, her guests lately. I, I've seen uh, some of the guests. I've not listened to the podcast. I have no interest, to be honest. You've seen the guest list. So, you know, it's like one crazy after another. Yeah. Um, yeah. That I guess support where her mind is at now, which, um, you know, um, it's confounding all medical professionals. That and, is true. Um, that's true. And that's what was so sad that, you know, if you go back to the original Roseanne show, she really spoke to middle America. And the struggles, which I hadn't seen since the years of Norman Lear and his shows, which I grew up on. And that's why I loved the show. And I loved hearing her stand up comedy routine in the beginning because um, it was really unique and we needed to hear that. And now I don't I don't know when I just hear her screaming, I want again, I go back when you read the book in the book, I talk about when we got on the show, I just wanted to hug her. I thought if I hugged her, like the world would be better for her. And everybody on staff is like, do not touch her. Don't go near her. If she sees the whites of your eyes, she might fire you. So um, we were told to find the tallest person on set, stand behind them. And um, and then maybe you could last, you know, longer than two episodes on the show. So that was John Goodman? Uh, uh, it was uh, a writer, actually. Um, John was on set, so I couldn't really hide behind mm. him. And then when we wrote the lesbian kiss episode, we hear, who the hell wrote this? And everybody parted. It was, and suddenly me and Jim were there shaking and we had like walked to, you know, see the wizard. And um, I was the scarecrow with my legs buckling and um, walking up to her on set. You know, she's at the kitchen table and um, said, this is fucking funny. And uh, can I swear, is that okay? Oh, uh, I yeah, don't have a problem swear. with it. I swear okay. like a sailor. Okay. Well, if I channel Amy Sherman uh, Palladino, uh, I'll be swearing a lot. Um, who we met actually on Roseanne. Yeah, that was actually uh, one of our questions. We we, we, we saw that you met on Rose, 
Roseanne, I'm curious how your impression of her, of Amy Sherman Palladino, uh, changed from Roseanne into... Yeah, she was just Amy Sherman then. Ah. And she had been on the show a few years. We actually got offered the show uh, before the show went on the air, and we turned it down. And at that time, Lori and John were not attached. But I loved Roseanne, but when you go to sign a deal like that, you have to agree to like seven years. And it was just so many questions. Um, and we were still excited about developing our, our own shows that we turned it down. And then later on, we ended up coming back uh, into the fold, so to speak. But it was, I think, uh, one of the very first days. Uh, usually shows would have eight, 10 writers. That show had 21 writers. Wow. So what they would do is, you know, they were always on the road, they being Tom and Roseanne, um, they would kind of collect their uh, stand-up comic friends. You know, and it's hard back then, even still, um, to make a living on the road like that. But it was people like Norm MacDonald and Pat Bullard. and um, I mean, those are big names now. Now, yeah, but they were not writers back then. And so they said, ah, come on the show. We'll give you a job as like punch up people. And so that's why the staff ballooned to that many. So we had to break off into different rooms. And Jim and I got in charge of mostly the stand up comics. And Norm would be in there and he would talk about, I'm going to be the biggest comic ever. And I'm like, yeah, Norm, okay. Uh, but let's stick to the script. And it was great for them because they got to learn from us that they could pitch jokes, which were always hysterical, but unless they came from character, they couldn't get in the script. So we really, you know, taught them what, how that is uh, done for, you know, when you're writing a uh, scripted series. But of course we'd be like on the floor laughing all the time with them. Um, so that's why the staff got so big, but uh, so it was one of the very first days and we were all in the room, 20 of us, there was one missing, and we were discussing a scene with Darlene, you know, the Sarah Gilbert character, and planning it out and everything. And then in comes this woman with, maybe she was wearing a top hat then. I don't remember, but it was some, you know, she looked very striking with, you know, dark black hair and very, you know, white skin. And she came in and we pitched it to her, the group, and instantly she just ripped it apart. And, but explaining why this wouldn't work. And the thing I loved about her is that she solved it. It wasn't, just, you know, a lot of people can complain and point out problems, but she was like, no, it came to this. But if you did this, 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 and this, this would make it a better scene. And then we broke for lunch or something. And Jim and I looked at each other and go, who the hell is this woman? So we tra traced um, where she was going to, followed her into her office, which was desk filled with candles, you know. And uh, we said, who are you? We have to know you. And then we became instant friends. So that when the showrunner would say, break off into groups, he would say to Amy, who do you want? And she always said, Jim and Stan and Lois Bromfield, who was this filthy mouth lesbian stand-up comic who we knew before. I mean, every other word out of her mouth is a swear word. I don't think she knows many other words, <clears throat> but you will, I mean, you just scream when you're with her. And Amy would say, get in my car, we're going to dinner, and we're going to write a Darlene Roseanne scene. Those really beautiful scenes when they would sit on the bed, and, um, and I would be like a panic. Uh, the writers are going to hate us. We can't go out. We can't drink. And she's like, we're ordering a bottle of wine, and we're writing a scene. <laughs> and we came back with great scenes and just really had so much fun. And uh, we stayed in touch, and uh, you know, I adore her, and that's how I ended up on Gilmore Girls. Was Amy, uh, so Amy was a writer on Roseanne too, right? So she wasn't the showrunner, like she wasn't Gilmore Girls. Was that no, different, a different gosh. dynamic? Oh, completely. And, but it wasn't, uh, you know, from writing on Roseanne to suddenly your showrunner, we stayed in touch. Um, you know, she has a reputation of uh, being difficult and I think it's just, she's very specific and a lot of, you know, male writers and male executives don't like that. So we would always go and help her out on different pilots. And, but for a while there, she was unemployable. And Jim and I would take her to lunch and say, come on, let's all think of an idea. We'll help you pitch it. And, um, you know, we even once pitched her an idea about uh, the Palm Springs Follies. And now she's doing it, actually. It's right? doing it. Yeah. Um, 
Is that the one? I or is so. that the dance one? I think they may be separate. Oh. The Palm Springs Follies is actually a film. I think oh. she's directing with Bette Midler. Uh, but I came down here and the Palm Springs Follies is a super cool thing show they used to do down here where they would take old uh, Broadway dancers, but now they're like 70 and 80, had kind of given up everything. And they put them in a show and suddenly you see these people doing the splits and dancing and having a, another life. And someone made a short uh, documentary that was nominated for an Oscar and we showed it to her because we always thought there's something in this world. And, you know, her parents being old show business people, I think she really responded to that. Um, but we've been through a lot with her. And so uh, we were in development at uh, different studios. And she said, come to have drinks with me at Chateau Marmont, which is a really super cool old school hotel in Hollywood. And her and Dan. And uh, she had me at Martini's. And she said, I would like some friends on staff just to... So it's not always a rotation of writers. And uh, we agreed to go on for a year and one of the best decisions we made. Um, and I just felt my job was to have her be in a happy place, <clears throat> which is similar to something I did when my mother and father got divorced. I was kind of the middle child and the peacemaker and I guess the court jester in a way. <laughs> So I kept thinking with Amy, you, you're on a great show, great actors and great writing. Like you should be having the time of your life because we had been in development many, many years and we knew how difficult it is to get a show on. And for her to have a show with that cast, just enjoy. Yeah. What was it like coming on? You came in in season five, so they were really established. Was it different coming in so late into the show? We had seen... I had watched the pilot, maybe one other episode, but we were so busy, I wasn't really watching the show. I knew it was really good just because of the people involved. So when we agreed to do it, suddenly we were going to start, I think, in four or five days, like on Monday, and it was a Wednesday or Thursday. So Warner sent over these two or three huge boxes, and then I feel like they were video cassettes. So I just would make food and sit there and go... I'd have to get up and put in the next one, the next one. You know, maybe there were two or three episodes on a, on a cassette. And I had to watch seasons one through four. Well, by the fourth episode, I was hooked. I was like, oh, I can't wait to get in there. And then uh, the first month or two, uh, Amy and Dan, although they lived in the city, they also rented this house out in Malibu. And... We could see the ocean, but we were locked in the house and the shutters were closed and I would have to go into the bathrooms like, oh, there's water, there's, there's, land, <laughs> there's safety out there, people. And they locked us in there. We uh, discussed what you know they wanted to do and how we could help uh, creating the season. And that's when we came up with the overall arc of the season being um, couples breaking apart and coming together, which I loved. Now, do you remember what, was your big break or what do you consider your big break when you started? Um, I guess it would really have to be the very, very first TV show we got. I was working as assistant manager at the Vista Movie Theater, which is now owned by Quentin Tarantino. Um, mm -hmm. So a, a lot of uh, full circle moments, which I talk about in the book. Um, he was actually an extra on Golden Girls. So I, I consider myself the gay Kevin Bacon. I'm somehow connected to every person in Hollywood. Um, I didn't say slept with, but I'm connected to. I just want to clarify that. Um, not by choice. But anyway, um, so uh, uh, I was working there and then we suddenly got these two offers on two different shows. And um, we picked this one show because our mentor was involved in the producing of it. And uh, I remember, uh, we were having to start on Monday. Things always happen over a weekend, I guess. And I was missing New York and my writing partner, Jim and I, uh, I didn't even have a credit card to my name. I think I had my mother's credit card. I went to the theater, I gave them my keys to the theater and they're like, keep it. We know how jobs in Hollywood work. And I said, no, <laughs> I'm not coming back here. I was just determined. And Jim and I drove to LAX without plane tickets. Who would do such a thing? 
And we were just going to buy them at, and go to New York for a weekend and just be crazy. Um, that shows how young we were. And I remember just leaning out the window screaming, this is life. <laughs> I, I was so excited and to spend, you know, two, three days in New York and then uh, landing at, which is now the Sony lot in Culver City. And we were so friggin' nervous. I think we, we stopped in every bathroom along the way to our office. I mean, we had such stomach aches. We didn't know what to expect. And we get there and they're like, oh, here you have an office. And we're like, we have an office? We just thought we were staff writers. And then we go and we sit in on our first big meeting and um, we're taking notes because we thought we were like secretaries or assistants. We didn't realize, no, you're writers on staff. And there's like, you're going to be writing one of the first episodes. We're like, what? And they said, yeah, um, pick, you take this idea, go to lunch, come back. You'll pitch us how the episode lays out. Well, I don't think we ate lunch that day. I was just, we were so nervous. Then we came back in and I guess we pitched a good job with it. And um, we wrote it and they really liked it. And uh, we got to be the first one up. It was not the best show. And there was some controversy surrounding it. And I hate to even bring up what it is, but with IMDb, you can't really hide your credits anymore. Um, <laughs> That's true. We, we, we did, we did look scroll it up. through your IMDb. We, we did, <laughs> we did look through. Yeah, so you know what it is. Um, do you? In 1983 is the first one I saw from you. Yeah, I think just, it was like... Just Our Luck. Yeah. And it starred T.K. Carter and Richard Gilliland, who was married to Gene Smart. Uh, he passed a few years ago. Very talented guy. But he played a weatherman on a local L.A. Uh, TV station who was jogging down Venice Boardwalk, knocks over uh, somebody that's selling some crap, and it's a bottle, and out pops a black hip genie. Yes, this I, is true. I did read the captions on, <laughs> on that one. I was intrigued. and Shocking, shocking. <laughs> and get this. He says, what can I do for you, master? Oh, nobody said, um, maybe that's not the best dialogue to have a black. Well, it was the early 80s. Guy. That would not fly. I don't days. care. I, I knew back then it was you wouldn't say well, that. Fair. And so, yeah, so they got a lot of crap for that. And that also we got pulled into it because uh, I think it was the NAACP said, why are they hiring two white guys over any in, inexperienced white guys? Um, yeah. So there was that. Um, but we had Roy Orbison as a guest star in one episode we wrote. We uh, got Don Cornelius, who was the host of Soul Train. Oh. Mm. That was super cool. Yeah. Um, that show did not last very long. We did film 13 episodes, uh, but I think only seven or eight aired. Yeah. And also I'm going to have to make it my mission to go track down those episodes yes. and watch them. Um, I should make copies of them and put them out on YouTube or something. You should. Yeah. I'm curious. I saw on the back of the book cover or book jacket that you originally wanted to be an actor. Did you decide to switch to writing because you got this big break or what, what made the switch for you? Uh, I went to NYU to be an actor uh, at 17 and I had to audition to get in. I started acting when I was seven. Uh, I started rewriting the scripts from theater camp because they were so God awful. And uh, so that was my first, um, kind of foray into writing or rewriting and I would make them very funny and uh, the theater camp uh, heads were very upset with me until they couldn't stop me because everybody loved and laughed at them. Uh, but then when I, my last year of college, I started auditioning and I auditioned for a CBS pilot. It was about an ensemble comedy revolving around uh, Senate pages. Mm -hmm. And I went in, I did get a call back, but my face, I was so nervous, was shaking. Like I could feel it shaking. I'm like, can they see? They might think I have some medical issue going on. <laughs> they probably should have called an ambulance. Um, and I was like, I, I, this isn't for me. I can't do this. This is just <clears throat> not. Um, and at that same time, I was beginning writing with Jim Berg. Uh, and we were writing pilots in between classes and after school jobs. And then we got an agent. And we were getting really positive feedback. And so I kind of gave up acting a little bit. When I moved to LA to pursue writing, uh, I did little jobs. Like I was an extra in risky business and, um, you know, just to make 
little money here and there. That's but writing fantastic. just opened I mean, doors. People seemed accepting of us as writers. Yeah. But now I've gotten back into acting. Um, I've been acting in my uh, suicide awareness play right before I go all around the country. I just was in Austin. I've done the play with um, uh, actor Hill Harper, who's now running for senator in Michigan. I've done it with Vanessa Williams and Blair Underwood and um, Virginia Madsen and cast members from Gilmore Girls. That was super cool. We got to go to five different cities with Nick Holmes and um, Shelley Cole, and that was great. And so I. That's been my latest passion is marrying art and advocacy together. And with this mission, uh, I created this play called Right Before I Go after a very close friend of mine died by suicide about 11, 12 years ago. I'm sorry. And uh, it's published. And so a lot of different theaters have been bringing me in to act with their local actors. I actually saw that was that one happened near us. It was like an hour or two away from us, but uh, you weren't in it, unfortunately. But, what? Yeah. yeah, you did like an interview on Instagram. I saw you uh, promoting it, but yeah, you weren't in it. So I was like, ah. you want to tell him you about gotta... your missed brush with being an extra? Oh, gosh, no. <laughs> well, tell me which movie. Uh, it was uh, The Judge with uh, Robert Duvall and Robert Downey Jr. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. Yeah. And they were filming right down the street, like 100 yards from your yeah. apartment. I didn't, I didn't think it was real. They, everyone was like, oh, you should come. I did acting throughout my uh, high school and college. And yeah, they were like, you should come down. I didn't think it was real. And then everyone sent me photos of them being extras and uh, I didn't show up. <laughs> what was your what was your best role that you played? Uh, I didn't have any good roles. I Calpurnia in uh, Julius Caesar was probably my favorite. But yeah, wow. oh, nothing you're exciting. A, but You're a classic actor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, a lot of full circle moments, though, I'm noticing from you. It seems like you went from acting to writing, now back to acting. It seems and it's interesting because it's the same as Gilmore Girls. I feel like all their episodes are very full circle. So I'm very interested to see how uh, these full circle moments come up in this book that you're writing. Because it must be all about that. It's a lot about that. And what Amy did in Gilmore Girls, which is so different than any other hour shows, is she takes uh, in half hours, you kind of. Uh, have buttons to scenes like jokes you know you, you can never come into a room without a joke and or leave so we structured each scene like that which wasn't normally done for an hour show so it gives you this nice arc and we would sit in the room and actually do the choreography of each scene so there's a nice little like ah at every and I think that's why people really respond it's just you're laughing or smiling or went somewhere it's not just random scenes here and there I, I think that uh, is something that gives Gilmore Girls a lot of staying power is the, well, one, the the narrative that is continued through all of the episodes rather than more of a piecemeal type uh, collage of episodes. Uh, did you find writing with future episodes in mind more difficult or did do you like writing it was standalone episodes? It tough because... Um, well, in half hours, they call, they're called evergreen. So back in the day, so that you could mix and match. It wasn't like, you know, you could just turn on Hulu and, you know, or pick an episode. It was when it came up, it came up in a rotation and syndication. Right. So they wanted it to be that they could kind of be out of order. Um, what I like, and, and even Roseanne kind of did that. They told a story. So she had jobs. People died. She left jobs. She was fired. Real life that I like. The like Golden Girls, as much as I love that, it was hard for me to watch future episodes because they were kind of repeating storylines or I would see they would do jokes later on that were almost like um, faded versions of ones we originally did. Right. Because they didn't really want the, those characters to grow and change. You know, that's what was so cool about Gilmore Girls and Roseanne. Those characters changed and had different relationships and, you know, otherwise we wouldn't have all the different teams for Rory. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, she, we wanted to ask you what team you're on. And there oh, is only well, one right answer. <laughs> is it the one I'm going to give? <laughs> probably, probably not. not. <laughs> no, I know you probably hate Logan. I have to say Logan because uh, as you'll read in the book, um, you know, we were there when, when he was invented and that whole year when she went to school and that character and that actor specifically. Um, 
I don't want to give too much away, but I remember going into the writer's room and out front was where the casting was. And there were two actors, a blonde and a dark haired. And I walked in and of course, seeing the blonde, he was just so handsome. I said, like, who is that guy? And they said, those are the two final contestants, contestants, like it's a game show, but uh, contenders uh, for Logan. I said, you have to pick the blonde one. I said, I just, I'm very much into colors. And I thought their contrast, and he looked very different than um, the other men in Rory's life. Um, I just saw that he just looked like old school money. And I told Matt that later, years later, go, you owe everything to me and you're welcome. Um, and uh, yeah, he got the job. And I yeah. thought he was great in it. They just had this, you know, yeah, the character. I mean, I wasn't involved in the, um, the Netflix. I don't like that he fooled around. And, you know, his I don't think anybody that. likes that. No, and I don't like that Rory did it. I mean, I, I probably in the room, if I was there, I would have been like, no, that, I really want them together. Let's not make, you know, but it gave interesting complications, you know, and that's Amy, you know, pretty much didn't shy away from stuff like that. I would, I would say that Logan is a, a solid second choice. I think everyone can agree <laughs> that Dean is not the best choice. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm curious when you came onto the show and like you had Logan and other things that were established, were you given like direction on what to put in the script or did you guys just kind of get free reign to kind of do what you want? Or did Amy say, no, this is the narrative, <laughs> right? What I'm looking well, for. Well, we discussed every minutia of the narrative. Mm -hmm. She wanted to hear our opinions. I mean, they came into it, obviously, you know, when you're married and, spending all day with your partner writing and otherwise they've talked about it but you know when you hire staff you want to get their opinion so we would say well i like this because of that or what about i don't know about that or how about this and so you hope that people are going to come in there and and bring up stuff that maybe they hadn't thought about and um so they were open to that and then uh you know she gave me and Jim a little more latitude in scripts than I think she did the other people because she knew us and liked us in that history. Uh, a lot of other people she rewrote a lot. Um, she liked it to go through her. So I don't know whether she liked her writing or she just liked us. I don't know, but we got a lot more uh, words in there in the scripts. Um, but it was tough. It was, you know, you have to get inside her head. It's so, it was so personal. Uh, but our job is to let her get it out of her head and onto paper and then onto the screen. It's not about, which I had to learn early on, uh, when I got on staff, I would be, you know, this young kid that looked even younger. And I would just say like, well, why are these two lead characters friends? Not on Gilmore, but other shows. And they didn't want this stupid kid to be saying that because it pointed out that maybe they wouldn't have been friends. You know, it was a fake sitcom. Uh, so I always came from it, I think, from my acting background, which was um, method acting and bringing realism to it. So I would do that to my writing. It has to be real. Why are they? Let's, you know, and very early on in our writing career, we would get these scripts and it would be like a woman. She's, you know, early 20s and pretty and I would raise my hand and go can we give her one more characteristic I mean how do you let's how do you write that that's not fair to the actor it's not fair to anybody and they would just like that yeah, just shut up and write it like well no you know is she give her complications but what does she want out of life but all this stuff people are more than just one one thing and it just especially like women they, everyone they, especially everybody women. everybody it's, but i found because they were written by men they would give the men more uh complications and characteristics and i think they were just you know unhappy in, in their relationships and wanted beautiful actresses to come in and, and be in the show <laughs> i mean to be really blunt um you know it was a different time and but there was that kind of philosophy and also the the people that they were hiring had to look a certain way and like, well, but people in my life look all different ways. Why, why are we not representing that? Uh, I think that's one of the, the most noticeable things about Gilmore girls 
or Golden Girls, a lot of the shows that you've been a part of, is that they're they're normal people, more so Which than a lot unusual of unusual for television back then. It's very unusual for television back then. It was you know Charlie's Angels and Free's Company, and people had to look like that and have those body types. Friends, and friends, yeah. Look at that. Um, so you know, and then shows like The Office came along, and it was just regular people looking, and that was really cool. And I, I think kind of shook up. And the world was changing, thank God, and still needs to change more. You know, it it's, does. It's, it's it's an evolution, and it's it's a constant fighting for. Uh, I was on a recent project, and I'm like really we can't have more diversity like why do i have to say that in 2023 it seems absolutely crazy um but i think i always felt i think because being gay i always felt like an outsider so i always was very sensitive about other people um so i think that's why i would raise my hand and um I think that's a good attribute to have. Do you think that that manifested in what you wrote? Absolutely. I don't think, I think that's one of the reasons why I write for women. Uh, you know, unfortunately in the beginning, there were not a lot of women in the writer's room. There were no gay people in the writer's room. We had to be in the closet. And I might tell people that, especially on Golden Girls, they're, they're, they can't believe it. I'm such a progressive show that had such a, what people think is a gay voice. No, Jim and I were the gay voices. We were in the closet in, with our voices. Um, so that's also in the book. How do you go to work in a profession where you're supposed to open your mind and your heart and put it out there in the room? And we couldn't. We were told if you have an event dealing with the show, you bring a woman as your date. Um, so a little history lesson just in how that all opened up uh, for people and uh, you know you want to be your authentic self especially in a job uh, like writing on the show uh, for for writing characters specifically do you feel like you have certain voices down more than others did you take a more broad approach of writing the episode or how, how did that work? Do you like writing characters that are like yourself or different from yourself? All, um, <laughs> I think, uh, you know, there's certain characters like I love Sophia, uh, Blanche, I would act out the part in our, um, offices. So again, from, I would come up from an actress point of view and would read the lines and, and I'd have to explain to Jim, she wouldn't say that there's no motivation for it, but we need some help along the way. Um, I think with Gilmore Girls, it was easier because I grew up in a family that had the grandmother, mother, my sister relationship there. Mm. Uh, so it was very strong. So that felt, I felt at home in that world. Um, yeah, I mean, very early on in our careers, well, as a young actor, I was told, go to the mall and just watch people and think of what they think. And um, so I've always, even in solving problems and in directing a lot of plays, my philosophy is put yourself in someone else's shoes, see how they feel. And uh, that's kind of how I live my life. And I think it helps when writing. I personally think there's some people that believe you can only write who you are and I would say but like how do you write science fiction then how do you <laughs> write period pieces I believe that um, we can all grow more if we do put ourselves in other people's shoes or write uh, roles that aren't necessarily us I think it gives you much more understanding like oh that's what you must go through yes you have to have representation in the room especially on a staff but I, I don't think we should shy away from think of what people can learn if, you know, even when you think of, you know, a very right wing person having to write a liberal character or vice versa, like where, how do you find the humanity, the heart in that person that believes what they're doing is right? I think that's that's how I we can come together instead of being so polar. I, I think putting yourself in, the position of someone that you don't 
see ideologically ideologically on the same field is one of the hardest things to do. And I I wish that pe- more people would be willing to take up that challenge because it's it to me leads to a lot of worse writing and, and worse character development in a lot of mediums where they're not taking that moment to to put themselves in that position. Or no character development because they haven't taken the time to go, what is that like? What is it like to walk in a room and feel othered? Um, so, and again, maybe that comes also from my method acting of uh, what is what can I find that could correlate to that feeling? And, you know, certain things are, you can only take it to a certain level, like, I know I can go out, maybe people may not know I'm gay and I can pass, you know, or with color of my skin, I can't change that. I don't know what that would be like to walk into a room, but I you know other things that can maybe get me partly there and the rest, again, as a writer, I like to think you can use your imagination or you can start to feel or read or learn and go, oh my God, think of how I feel so empathetic to people all the time that I saw some interview with um, uh, the Moms of Liberty women that were hearing oh, so much oh, about. Oh, you're a braver man than I. Yeah, and they were interviewing her, and she was very upset because they were teaching empathy in schools. And I'm like, wait a minute. I thought empathy was a good thing to have, <laughs> that, but, but her and her like are turned into something negative. And I think, well, how are we ever going to coexist in the world if someone can't be empathetic, that's like, that should be where we start. It's a basic <laughs> uh, need. <laughs> I think, but it, it just, it's, it's turned into this partisan divisive thing where people are just flat out refusing to try to see the other side of things in all, yes, in all aspects of life. Without getting to uh, other sideisms, I think there's definitely people that banning books and that's, that's not the, that's worse than I don't believe your viewpoints. I don't want you to see those. That yep. goes, so it's not either or. That's something that is being aggressively attacked of ideas. Like believe what you want to believe, but you cannot put that on somebody else, I don't think. No. And I people, don't know if this is controversial, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Yeah. Uh-oh. Um. So Gilmore Girls is really progressive in the fact that women are the main characters and a lot of the storylines are very progressive, but there's a character in there, uh, Michelle, that the question was whether or not he was gay until, you know, year in the life. And I'm wondering if there was any talk in the writer's room throughout season five or, you know, your time there of how to present him and, you know, what you wanted to do there. I've spoken about this at the fan fest, uh, society events uh yeah of course uh i would bring that up to amy and like let's what about a storyline where he gets a boyfriend and she's like he's not gay i'm like wait a minute stop (laughs) you're telling me that this character i've been watching is not gay i mean i have good gaydar i (laughs) I know a gay person like but then i just had to it's her show i'm like okay and i was surprised that she didn't want at that point to delve into that. I don't know why I, you'd have to ask her. Um, so I was really glad that was one of the, you know, besides the, the long musical number, uh, in, in the year in a life, I was glad that he got to have a personal life. Uh, I think, cause that was important. Um, you know, but then again, you have to pick so many battles. Would that have been a battle? I, I don't know. I can't, I can't answer that. I, I know I did bring it up. I'm sure on more than one occasion. Um, and, you know, I, I know Yannick just a little bit and like I ran into him not that long ago and I was just so happy for him um, to be able, and, and I don't know, maybe the actor didn't want to do it, but there was something there when we were on the show uh, that it did not. It's a different time. Yeah, but it was still a time post Roseanne and post Ellen and post Will and Grace even. Like, come That's on. True. Like, how great would that have been to explore that in Stars Hollow? I think given the the additional character depth of Gilmore Girls, it would have been especially impactful and more. Think about Liz Torres and Sally Struthers. My God, they would have glommed onto that. I have an idea. Why don't I do uh, a gay couple that 
buys um, the dragonfly in and turns into a gay B and B. There you go. <laughs> There's a sequel so much for fun. You. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it would be switching terrible. gears a little bit with respect to the script. Uh, there are a lot of references in Gilmore Girls. Was was the responsibility to come up with references only on Amy Sherman Palladino, or were you all listed out different things that you had to include in the script and you had to work that in? I think when you write on a show that exists, you take on that voice. And that is a whole other unique um, talent. You know, you can write scripts, but be able to mimic the style of another writer. That's a whole other craft in a way. And we were always very good at that. I think, again, it's listening. Um, so we knew that was part of it. So like, uh, what was it, the Mothman Prophecy or something we put in that? I don't know why. I never saw the movie. But <clears throat> somehow it, it came out of my mouth and as we were writing. And um, so I like all those crazy references. I also love that Amy didn't give a shit about whether people knew it or not. When normally when you're on a show, if you have a reference, <clears throat> someone will say, well, not everyone will know that. And she was like, I don't care. Let them look it up. And <laughs> that changed everything writing for me since that point. If I want a reference, if it's in character, so what? I mean, people, others, oh, who's Paul Anka? Well, that's what makes the show so unique. It wasn't uh, going to such a low common denominator that everybody, you know, and again, that goes back to old television style that you just wanted everybody to know because you were afraid they might change the channel. And now those voices are so special and that's why the show lives on and on and on. Although there are some Golden Girl references where people make fun of me and they go, who the hell is John Cameron Swayze? And I go, I listened to the, him, my dad listened to him in the car uh, after Sunday school on the ride home. And so I would sit back and fall asleep to that voice. And now people are like, who the hell is that? But um, it makes it unique, I think. I think listen, watching the episodes and not knowing all the references is part of the fun of watching Gilmore Girls is learning from the show as you're going and trying to learn through the perspective of the characters. I, I just think that's one of the things that makes it so endearing. Well, now just, they call them nuggets. So um, I we just wrote, Jim and I wrote a Lifetime Christmas movie called Ladies of the 80s, uh, uh, Divas Christmas. And we did watch that. We have watched uh, that, actually. Yes. Yeah, so there's a lot of little nuggets in there, like giving the actresses the characters names uh like ewing or last names that they had played little things like that so now people are having fun with uh, you'll watch it again and again and you, you can find all those little things but back in the day you know originally with gilmore girls amy was going way against the grain of putting all those crazy references and by the time we got on there it was just like the more the merrier <laughs> just throw them in you know and laurel i could go off on these crazy rants that you know, hockey puck, whatever, you know. Monkey, monkey, underpants. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I, well, I, I just think people, it's, yeah. it, <laughs> it plays more to the modern idea of the reader watch value of the, the episodes uh, more so than worrying about changing the channel because of all of the different sources that you can find the content. It's, it's more, it's changed more to, how many times can you watch the same thing over and over again without getting sick of it? Or, yeah, and in a way, um, it's almost like a book. You know, like you can go back and read a, a book and uh, look at it or, or pause, put the book down and check something out. Uh, it wasn't like regular television. And I just really applaud Amy for pushing that kind of format and style forward. I love the fast pace of it, like a 40s movie. And uh, that really influenced me as far as my theater directing career. And also, you know, little that I've directed on film. Uh, I just like that, like real life, it's fast, fast, fast. So that when you do take the moment, it's so much more meaningful that I find, you know, when you, certain styles of shows are just so slow that when the, the real dramatic moment comes, you're just kind of like, yeah, that's like every other moment. But you know, like in an Amy Sherman Palladino show, when they stop, you're going to lean in and listen. And I do that in my directing as well. It's, it's like a book or 
a a conversation with a dear friend, it's it's more personal than just the the sound bites and the snippets of conventional television. And that's what my book is like. I want it to be as if we were all sitting there having, you know, a cup of coffee at Luke's or a glass of rosé somewhere. Um, yeah, where would we get rosé in Stars Hollow? The secret Maybe bar, that, I would guess. Yeah, I guess so. Is that the only place? Someone should open so. a wine bar or something in that town. I think I think Taylor runs an underground speakeasy, <laughs> is my theory. Yeah, but does he have rosé there? <laughs> Probably not. I no, I feel like whiskey or something for those cold winter <laughs> Connecticut nights might have a hot toddy or like mulled wine or something for the seasonality but yeah it's it's out of character he, for he seemed gay too i think i brought that up but it was like he has to stop, be, right stop with stop with the gay stan <laughs> like okay <laughs> um no. you know but bet and miss patty i'm sorry they they would have they would have found the gay people in that town and and uh befriended them uh, they would have they would have had so much fun with it yes as i have with liz and sally but especially liz in real life, we've gotten to be very close, uh, which I didn't know her at all during my time on the show. Um, I, when Amy asked us to come on staff, she knew I wanted to direct. So she's like, oh, you'll be on the set and you'll learn all that. No, uh, we went down for cake for the hundredth episode. That was about it because that was a, such a small staff. It was five people. That's all. Um, and there was some dysfunction in the room and we could not leave. We could not leave. So I was, you know, a couple of times we'd be outside on a break at the picnic table and Melissa McCarthy would come and hang out with us. And that was always fun. Uh, but mostly, and like I knew Emily Broda from a past sitcom we wrote for her. But, you know, at the table reads, I got to know them. I got friendly with, um, with Lauren uh, at, at the first table read. We were driven on a cart. And I saw her over by her truck smoking a cigarette. And it's like, it was literally, she was Lorelei. And I go marching up to her and she's like, oh, you can't talk to me. If you talk to me, you're going to get fired. <laughs> and I said, I don't care. Let them fire me and I'll go home and collect a paycheck. I don't care if Amy you know, doesn't want me talking to you. Well, she liked that a lot. And that's how we got to be friends. Do you keep in contact with a lot of the people from the show? <clears throat> um, well, I've cast a lot of them in my plays uh Eris uh, is in my Aunt Frank I've cast Rini um I've been wanting to work with Emily again um Vanessa Morano um I adore her I hopefully she'll do my play in, in the summer um Lauren um we kind of lost touch I did we did have a communication after Matthew Perry passed because I, I had met him once briefly at a party of hers. And uh, I knew, you know, that was a tough time. And I just wanted her to know, just thinking of her, very simple. Um, uh, but I do miss her a lot. I was so happy when she went and did Guys and Dolls on Broadway. And that was, I know, a big moment for her to be singing and just doing a Broadway show. She just recently had a book tour, too, I believe. Yes, I watched a lot of those clips um, with her friend Sam Pancake, who I know. And he actually helped me a lot. I had him play me in uh, uh, early reading of Right Before I Go. And uh, it was in my living room. I had just finished a draft where I added the character of the narrator. And he said, I know why you asked me because of my history. And I, I didn't know what he was talking about. When he early on, when he first moved to LA, um, he had come home and he found his roommate in the closet hanging. That's and horrible. Horrible. I didn't know that. But and then he said, he challenged me. He said, "Stan, don't just say the narrator's a writer. Be specific. Be you." And I was so afraid to open my heart, and I never written by myself, always with a writing partner. And I really took his words to heart and, and opened my heart. And um, that's how that play came to be. Because, you know, so I, I owe him a lot for just, you know, challenging me to, uh, 
to put myself in the play and, and, and be honest and raw. And that changed the whole storyline and the spine of the play. Is that play still being um, put on? Yeah, I, I just haven't... did it in Austin. Um, and then uh, next month, we're going to try a, pro a pilot program of taking it into high schools in the San Fernando Valley uh, mm -hmm. with a wonderful organization called NAMI, which is National Association of Mental Illness. And they're sponsoring it. And if it goes well this one time, um, then we will take it at least once a month all over. And I hope that, that other people pick it up and start doing it because it's so important to talk to kids right now because I think, you know, having them dealt with COVID and being in the house and so much pressure and all the craziness in the world. Uh, I have found that young people are much more open to talking about it than people my age. But it's such a, the, the piece is meant to provoke conversation. It's less than an hour and then you're required to do a short talk back with a local mental health professional. Um, so, and my dream is still to get it to um, off Broadway. I would love to have rotating cast. I would love to have an all Gilmore cast that I could act with it. Maybe I, I can drag Yannick and Lauren to do it with me. That would be, I'd probably fall on the ground if that actually happened. But <laughs> what, what, a, what a cool thing that would be. But it would definitely get some Stars Hollow people um, to do it again. Uh, as a writer, spending all of this time deep in the weeds on the characters and the environment, uh, do you have anything from any of your projects about one of the characters that maybe the the viewers don't know, like something about their background or something that you've created in your head to explain more of who they are as a, a person? Um, you mean existing characters that I've already written? Yes. Either way. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I mean, just because uh, I have an acting background, I always give all my characters backstory. And some people know, some people don't know. And that's the beauty of when you're acting or writing. It's like those are your little um, secret kernels that you don't necessarily share with everybody. Um, I like to pull from as much reality. Uh, there was a time uh, on Golden Girls, uh, we had read a quote that, uh, Betty White had said about her late husband, Alan, Alan Ludden, in the New York Times. And we took that exact quote and put it into a script. And it kills me that I never got to tell her. I don't think she ever knew. Those words she was reading and acting in an episode were lines she actually said about her ex-husband, but she was talking about Charlie, the character. So that's always f interesting and fun to do, little things like that, of pulling from your own life. And I find that very helpful. Love that. Well, that actually leads me to my next question. Uh, who is your favorite actor to work with and why was it Betty White? <laughs> <laughs> it was not Betty White. Um, I have to say it was Estelle Getty. I mean, I just loved the way she would bang those jokes out every time. Uh, I really loved that. I, I did love the Darlene Roseanne scenes. I thought... Um, you know, and, and, and the Rory Lorelei scenes, those were really special, I think. And, and you can see that similarity, mother-daughter, that was just something Amy loved to do. And um, uh, for a writer, because I find women much more open uh, to discuss their feelings, it's free, more freeing as a writer. Uh, whereas men, you're having to write a lot of subtext because they're not saying anything. <laughs> Um, or as much. Um, uh, you were right the know. first time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Just being able to express your thoughts is uh, is pretty cool. But in each character, is figuring out how does that sound. Um, are they flowery in their uh, choice of words? Are they speak in staccato? Um, some people leave off certain words or letters. And that makes each one sound different. Uh, we learned that very early on. You can't have one joke written for one character. And then if it doesn't work, just switch it into another character's mouth. It, unless the actor requests that. 
you have to write specifically for the that character and that goes back to you know learning that on golden girls bringing it to the new writers on roseanne see how i went full circle <laughs> i love it <laughs> there you go so the book is coming out do you if anything you want to talk about or promote about the book because we've already bought one but <laughs> on yeah. amazon if there's other places do you let us know where um many places i mean it's also through simon and schuster and there's places you can get it for like a dollar or two off um just google the girls or my name um i think it also deals with the non-show business parts as well um and uh, spoiler alert so if you don't want to know uh turn off the sound um dealing with grief in my life um more than once and what that is like and figuring that out and uh i think People will, you know, you'll have a lot of laughs and a little tea spilled, but you'll also hopefully can take away how you deal. I mean, everybody deals with it and, 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 and it's so individualistic. And I kind of just put it out there that this is. Uh, Sounds amazing. Now you need to do a book tour. I want to do a book tour. So let's start arranging. Get me up to the Boston area. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, I am doing a big uh, signing at the Drama Bookshop uh, Tuesday, April 16th. And that's really exciting because I was a big, you know, theater nerd kid. And I would just hang out at the Drama Bookshop and just look at the titles of the plays and the posters. And I, now I can't believe I have four plays in there. So I'll be signing my plays and the book. Um, so that's kind of a, a big deal for me. And I'll, I'll be pinching myself that whole I'll be black and blue from the pinching. <laughs> that sounds so exciting. That's in New York, right? Yeah, in New York on, I think, 38th Street. And uh, I know a lot of Gilmore people are going to be there. And we'll all grab a drink after and uh, have a fun night. I'm going to have to write that down that date because we're not that far from New York. <laughs> well, April 16th? April 16th. And uh, right. then if I end up going to the festival, I would love to maybe do some book tours in the uh, the area, I know someone's talked about me coming to Manchester, New Hampshire and, uh, around that time and doing a little Lots book of stand events coming up. Yeah, so if you know any book people in that area, we could do a live uh, podcast from the bookstore. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, I think we are at an hour, so I want to wrap this up with you. But thank you so much for coming on. And I am sure. really excited to read the book. So I hope that it. Amazon yeah, gets it to him right away. She's been talking about it.